afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to another edition of the LBS Conversations. Another occasion to bring Lagos Business School into your homes. Today, we have gathered together some experts in organizational behavior, human resource management, and we're going to have a conversation about remote work, or if you like, remote virtual work, because now most people are working in remote locations mediated by technology. I mean, there are two domains that used to be apart, the home domain and the work domain. Right now, the boundary has been shifted. We, we think that this is both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, prepare, in preparation for this session, several of you sent questions, more than 3,000 questions. We reflected on this and then we have put together different people. We have Okechuku Ama, Dr. Okechuku Ama, Henry Onukuba, Olusoji George, Uchora Udoji, Uche Ato. Hopefully we'll be addressing some, or at least most of your concerns. I mean, we'll talk about the technicalities of remote work, the challenges of remote work, which will imply communication. Okay, Chukuama will address communication challenges. And another concern that most people have now is performance management. In order not to reduce performance management to just taking who is present. Present is not just being there, but how do we measure? What are the metrics that we're using right now? Another challenge that will be addressed is team synergy. Teams used to work physically together, but we now have them working virtually. And of course, when you have people, people are the most important resource that an organization has accounts on. We, we certainly will have to talk about emotional intelligence, and then we'll have Uchora Udoji to address that. And then we'll have the lawyer in the house, Uche Atom, because there are obligations, obligations of employers, obligations of employees. There are probably legal issues that for now are below the radar and nobody's talking about now because we are all for now trying to survive. Uche Atom will we'll talk about all these. And uh, I think I also would like to talk about the, the format the sessions will take. Each of the panelists will have three minutes to speak. Okay, so three minutes, three minutes, three minutes. And then in, in principle, that should take about 15 minutes. And then they will take a second round when, where they will each speak for two minutes. After which we will take your questions. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you will see an icon labeled Q and A. That's for the questions. I can see there's lots of greetings going on in the chat box, uh, but please try to put your questions in the Q and A box. That's very useful for several reasons. One, that's where we'll check to see your questions. Okay, so I have a colleague here who will be helping me to collect the questions. Secondly, there is a feature there that is not available in the chat box, which is that you can upvote questions. So if you see a question that you like and you think, well, I'd like to get the answer to this question, rather than type a fresh question, please upvote it. And then we'll be looking at the number of upvotes and then we'll take the questions from there. So hopefully we'll have at least 30 minutes for questions. And then before the Q&A starts, which is after the panelists have spoken for two rounds, we're going to give you a poll. It's a very short poll. We'll launch it before the Q&A. All right, so that's it. I think we're going to jump right into this and I'm going to invite Dr. Okechuku Ama to take the first shot. So, Okechuku. Okay, thank you, Eugene, and uh, thank, welcome to all the participants. We are going to be talking about communication for engagement in this trying period. But what I want to begin with is to try and lay a foundation a bit that makes this communication very necessary. There are fears and uncertainties in this period. Organizations are not even sure of their cash flow, their revenue, but they still have some expenses arising from working remotely. They are also not sure what to do with the employees and they have uncertainty as to how this will play out and the future. The employees are also worried about their health. 
They are worried about their cash flow also. And there are uncertainties as to whether they will have a job or they would even earn a salary. So you see that both the organization and the employee, they have something in common. And those of you who were here yesterday, we learned that organizations are actually engaging their customers, trying to find out what they need and what they can do. If you do that to your customer, then your people that are in between them, you must do it to them. Now, let me talk about the communication. In this period, communication is key. There are certain characteristics of a communication that will engage your employees. The first is that it must be a two-way communication. It must be factual and it must be truthful. You must communicate with empathy. That means that you are not just listening for the purpose of replying. You are listening so that you can enter into what the other is feeling. Now it must be authentic but optimistic. Authentic so that you can explain things the way they are and not give the impression that business is unusual. Optimistic so that you don't paint a very terrible picture of future so that there is nothing to look forward to. The communication must be continuous because things are not discussed at a go. The last set is that it must bring out trust and collaboration. Trust so that you can look at each other and decide on the options to go. Collaboration so that you can carry out whatever you have agreed. If you can keep to all this, you will discover that you will engage your employees, they will engage you, and since all of you share the same, same thing of having an organization today and an organization tomorrow, you will have so all of you will work together to be able to achieve this. Over Fantastic. to you. Fantastic, Akechiko. Thank you. Um, several people have been concerned about how to monitor employees' productivity and performance. Some people even said, how can we monitor them without micromanaging them? So, Henry Onukuba. Yeah, thank you, Eugene. Um, I'm thinking again to set a foundation to my answer. Well, despite the announcements of the president and uh, the state governor of Lagos State uh, about the gradual lifting of the work by Monday, I don't think it would be wise for organizations to rush into calling back the employees to work without first ensuring that their employees are going to be safe both in the office and on their way to and from work. As a matter of fact, the National Policy on Occupational Safety and Health provides that it is a duty of every employer to ensure so far as it's reasonably practicable the safety, health, and welfare of all workers. That's paragraph 5.31. So if you are not sure that your employees are going to be safe, then do not rush to call them back to work. So what do we need to do? So what that means is that we are here for a long haul. Remote working is going to be with us for a long time. So organizations need to start thinking about how we can improve performance remotely. Now, before you talk about performance management, there is no management if there is no performance. You can't manage what does not exist. So first is that managers have to ensure that productivity takes place remotely in the first place. How do you do that? I'll just say three things you can do. First is ensure that there is actually an office at home. You don't want your people to be working from on top of the bed or in front of the television in the sitting room. So you may ask them to send you a video, a short video, or a picture of their home office to ensure that there is actually a work going on at home. Second is that you need to provide the basic work tools. Now, computers and, laptop and uh, uh, laptops and phones are the basic things. But beyond that, you have to also you know, pay for data subscription, uh, internet connectivity, even pay for the fuel they will use to work remotely. And then the third one is what I call checking in before checking up. Now, checking up is performance monitoring. 
but checking it is, uh, uh, is emotional monitoring, welfare monitoring. So before you start asking your, your people how are they performing, performing at home, find out how they are faring in this uh, situation. Now, if you're able to do the productivity is going on at home or remotely, then you can talk about performance management. And for me, performance management is simple. When I come back, I'm going to tell you how simple it is, performance management, whether in the office or remotely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you very much. And then, um, Sergi, Teams. Team Synergy is a concern right now. Can you speak about that, especially in remote virtual work? Thank you very much, uh, Eugene. In today's uh, reality, where we work, or we must work remotely, collaboration is the key. Is the, I would say it's the key PR now. This is not the time to compete. How do you collaborate during this period? Like Henry said, the employers have to invest because you now need technology. So the employers have to subscribe. And of course, individuals have to make sure that they are up to date in the use of the technology. Thank God, the distraction from children can be minimized now because they are also working remotely, at least most of them. But this is also the time that you show empathy. I'm referring to the leadership. The leadership of the team will show empathy. This is not a normal environment where you start flying up queries. And of course, it's also important for integrity to come in. You have to set good goals, and the goals that are easy to be achieved, bearing in mind the circumstances. Decision making now must be participatory. That is, every member of the team, both the light team or the small one, must be part of decision making. I will speak more on this when I come back. Thank you very much, Eugene. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elusaji. Um, well, other, you talked about empathy, but I'm beginning to think about the intelligences at play, especially at the leadership level, uh, which, which I would like to ask you if you think that whether emotional intelligence is important in organizations at this time, especially at this time. Do you think so? And then why? Sorry, Uchara, 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 you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, individual emotional intelligence, but more critical to organizations and to leadership at this time is collective emotional intelligence. We are in a crisis situation. So there's uncertainty, there's change, there's ambiguity. And emotional intelligence is the intelligence that gives us the ability to cope with those kinds of pressures. Regrettably, it's a... Uh, it's, it has largely remained a missing factor in uh, the dynamics uh, of our workspace. Um, yes, why is it important to organizations at this time? First is that the gap between organizational goals and individual goals have never been wider. The severity of this gap at this time is likely to cause deep states of anxiety. Again, COVID has forced a measure of four key spaces four key self spaces, um, the workspace, the home space, the social space, and because we can't go to the church and we can't go to the mosque anymore, the spiritual space. So all those four spaces are co-located in the home space. And this brings its own pressures, uh, which can actually uh, impact uh, job performance. Um, and then there's the mental health challenge. All of a sudden, uh, there's a lot of pressure on us to wash our hands several times a day, to wear a mask when we must leave home, to wear gloves when we're taking uh, stuff out of our shopping bags. You know, we, we may not be aware of this, but these things create their own traumas. Um, again, you know, there are more, we're experiencing multiple shocks every day. Um, there's COVID, uh, there's uh, the associated inconsistent messages, 
uh, there's the lockdown with all the isolation problems. There's uh, news on TV about deaths. Um, uh, there's eruption uh, of new eruptions of the virus. There's threat to life and, and property. These things create fear and anxiety. And think about it. These shops are not sequential. They are simultaneous. And so there's hardly a time for you to set aside to self-regulate. Remember also uh, that some of our employees and even our leaders have pre-existing mental um, health conditions, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, and so forth. And there's absolutely no doubt that physical and social distancing will exacerbate their struggles. And so in a short time, organizations are very likely going to begin to experience a marked increase in mental health challenges arising from um, um, things like emotional exhaustion, emotional labor, emotional dissonance, and so forth. These things impact job um, performance. Therefore, during the um, post-COVID, the organization cannot be managed effectively without individual and collective emotional intelligence. In fact, organizations must begin to engage immediately uh, that ability, the ability to identify, use, or understand, and manage emotions to get their people in a state to do the things they, uh, that will facilitate performance. Thank you. Fantastic, Uchara. Thank you very much for that. Um, Uche Ato, our lawyer, what are the obligations? I'm sure there are many obligations of employers and employees legal considerations that we should keep in, time, keep in mind, especially at this time. All right, thank you very much, uh, Eugene. Good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just lay a little background. Nigeria, like Germany, like the US, is known to operate a highly legalistic and regulated work environment. This is because in addition to the operation of the common law, which is the origin contract, we also have in operation in the workplace, other laws which shape this environment. We're talking about legislation, about uh, international law. We're talking about even judicial pronouncements. But the one that is of importance to all this afternoon is a constitutional amendment that came sometime in 2010 that today by the Constitution of Nigeria, there is support for the importation and application of what is called international best practice in the workplace. The net effect of all these laws in the workplace is that today we are seeing a resurgence of a, what we call employer workplace obligations. And we are again seeing the readiness, some would even call it eagerness on the part of regulators to create additional obligation anytime they have the opportunity. From a community reading of all these laws, it is clear today that no matter the type of emergency, especially like the kind of lockdowns we have today, none of them will have the effect in themselves to be able to extinguish this obligation. Here we're talking about obligations in the area of payment of wages, provision of work, health and safety, on the part of employees, obedience, faithful service, due diligence. These obligations will even go beyond the issue of emergency. So as we transit to the new work arrangement, two things are important. One, we must recognize that these obligations that are in existence today will be carried over. Secondly, the new work environment, such as remote work, necessitates that especially employers must take certain steps in order to ensure full compliance. Some come to mind immediately. One contract, which is the foundation statement. The reason is that you can't build something or nothing. Secondly, in the area of quality of work, the remote work must meet minimum conditions in the area of what is called decent work. Thirdly, employee health and safety, because the remote work location is actually an extension of the office. Uh, Mr. Moderator, before I end this, let me just say something, that as we begin to move to this new employment situation, 
it is an opportunity for employers to avoid the kind of errors that we had during outsourcing. The reason is that this time around, we must stay ahead of the regulators to avoid the kind of embarrassment that some employers suffered in the area of outsourcing. Now, <clears throat> there is already in existence a body of international jurisprudence in this area. It is our duty to draw guidance from this area. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Uche. While you were speaking, I was thinking of something else, but we'll see. We'll see because several questions are coming in already. Should we downsize? Should we right size? We should we upsize? Whatever name we give to some of those decisions that are uncomfortable to make in the workplace. Several people are concerned about the opportunity that this situation presents. So people are even looking at post-COVID, how to manage remote work, especially in the post-COVID era, because everybody is seeing this as an opportunity. Anyway, I'm not going to preempt neither the questions nor what you have to say in the second round. So you're going to have two minutes, starting with Okechuku again, to, to continue your conversation. Okay, and thank you, Eugene. Let, let me address one issue. In my first discussion, I mentioned that the organizations are planning and they are looking at what to do with the employees, whether to right size, down size. It will be an error to think that the employees are not doing the same thing you are doing. They are looking at their own option. They are looking at whether you will right size them, downsize them. So when you now come up with whatever is your decision, it is not going to be a surprise to them because already whatever you are saying is an option they are considering. The only thing that is going to be a surprise to them is your emotional detachment in conveying this thing to them. What that will tell them is that they are not valued. They are just tools that you use when things you need them. And like a mechanic dumps his tool anywhere, you dump them whenever you don't need them. It has an implication for the post-COVID. At the post-COVID, if such people even come to you, they are coming as mercenaries because they now know that all of you are in the transactional relationship, which means that your employee engagement will suffer permanent quarantine and will never come up again. The second is, we normally say that organizations that are resilient and that are agile will survive. Now there is what we call error of reification, which means giving life to something that doesn't have life. With uh, this to my legal people, the organization has no life. The resilience the organization has, the agility it has, comes from the employees. Let's make this clear. If you don't create an environment where people are resilient, people are agile, you cannot talk about those two qualities. So the employees are actually positioned for you to be able to engage them. Like I said, you are already engaging your customers. You are already doing something to minimize their exposure. Why wouldn't you do something to minimize that of your employees? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Okechuku. Um, I'm wondering how organizations should set KPIs and measure them well, especially now that people are working remotely. Henry, earlier on, in speaking about performance management, you were talking about, you are going to talk about simple, S-I-M-P-L-E. How simple would it be? I'm sure our listeners would want to know. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me start, uh, let me just share one slide. Yeah, so these are the simple steps to performance management, even in these uh, times. So S is setting, of, of, uh, setting objectives. I is invite commitment. M, measure progress. 
P, provide feedback. L, link to consequences. And E, evaluate effectiveness. So let me just speak through these uh, this, uh, four, uh, six, six steps. So the objectives you set at the beginning of the year for 2020 has to be reset uh, because the, the present realities will not, may not permit those objectives to be met. So it is time for employers and managers to have objective setting discussions once again. All right? Now, remember that objectives must meet the SMART criteria. They must be specific. They must be measurable. They must be achievable. They must be realistic. And they must be time bound. Now, measurable and realistic are very key because you cannot set an objective that you cannot measure remotely. And you have to set realistic objectives. The second one is inviting commitment. Now, the leader or the manager or the uh, employer must have a positive mindset and a winning mentality. And then you cascade this to your team members. Now, the goals have to be challenging, but again, I said they have to be realistic. And then you must obtain commitment of your people. And at the end of the day, it would be nice to sign off the, the new objectives. You could use electronic signatures, sign it off and document and send to HR. Then measuring progress. Okay, you must have measurement indices. And because you are working remotely, I will uh, advise you have weekly uh, e-meetings, uh, performance review meetings. Start the meeting by getting personal, showing empathy, asking how are you doing, and then go to the main issue. And you may also consider asking your colleague to send you a report of his performance ahead of time. Now, provide feedback. There must be constant feedback don't push too, too hard because times are tough. Listen to the challenges. You may share information about others in the team in order to you know, encourage your, your, your guy to perform better. And if you can, provide extra support. Then the fifth one is linking to consequences. Every performance or non-performance must be linked to consequences. And Aubrey Daniels gave us four behavioral consequences. Now, I don't have time to go through that, but I would advise that at this time, you use more of positive reinforcement. That is encouraging the guy, your colleagues, to do as much as he could, given the circumstances. The final one is evaluating uh, effectiveness. Now, the only constant thing is change. As situations unfold, you should be ready to adjust the performance objectives you have set, you know. But again, this must be discussed and agreed upon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henry, for that simple model. Now, um, one of the concerns people have now, some people say that in these days of meeting and working virtually, meetings seem to be longer than in-person in -person meetings. <laughs> anyway, uh, Olusoji, earlier on you were talking about teamwork. Maybe we'll give you another two minutes to share more thoughts. Uh, you're muted. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene. I just want to briefly go into how do you create a remotely teamwork environment? Creation of a teamwork environment under what uh, today called the uh, first change. Number one, you must bear in mind the knowledge of the organization as a whole. What's the mission statement, the core values, and vision? And I want to cue behind Eric that you probably need to set new objectives, bearing in mind the present realities. You need to have the knowledge of the team members, their field. And of course, you also, the team members must now look at their own goals in life. That is paramount. And be able to align these with the goal of the organization. I'm saying all of this, assuming that the employers have provided for the real environment during this period. That is, how do you add some Naira to what 
is now a new office that is data, petrol, or diesel to fuel the. It is before, it is after you must have done that, that you will now go into those three steps that I have enumerated. Eugene, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Ulysses Toji. Thank you very much. I mean, there are several things that come into managing teams, but especially now managing virtual teams. I mean, several people are concerned about how do you establish presence, not just physical presence, but mental presence. How do you deal with troublesome employees? How do you motivate members of teams? So there are so many things that we can talk about, team synergy. But um, uh, which are, uh, yes, emotional intelligence. While you were speaking, several things were coming to mind. It's clear from your initial conversation that emotional intelligence is necessary at this time. But I'm, I'm beginning to wonder about leaders and members of teams in particular, what makes it important in leaders and members, especially at this time. And then if you could also perhaps look at from the lens of EI, whether any good can come from COVID-19, because earlier on we were talking about the different spaces, workspace, home space, social, spiritual space, COVID-19, can any good come from it in terms of EI? Or what do you think? Okay, so uh, typically when there's adversity, the first thing we look at, at are all the bad things that are happening around the, the matter of the adversity. But truly, a whole lot of good can come from even a bad thing. So for example, um, the research is that there's a useful relationship between emotional intelligence, creativity, and innovation. We have seen this in practice as well. And so this is a link that can be harnessed by organizations. Um, who would have told us, for example, that countries like Ghana, like Senegal, like Madagascar, would be leading the continent and indeed the world in science and technology in times like this. I'm also informed that in this country, in this Nigeria, a 20-year-old boy built a ventilator. I mean, these are some of the good things that are coming from COVID. Um, the research also is that without uh, realizing it, people tend to work harder and longer hours when they work remotely, it's backed by research. And we also have seen this in, in practice. You said something like this uh, a few seconds ago as if you were reading my, my mind. The reason is that because the 24 hours are more or less in your hands, it's easier to carry out tasks um, in a time and space that agrees with you. Once you've been able to get into that niche and you key into it, you go into flow state you're fully immersed, your focus is energized, and the process of the activity is, is enjoyed by you. And in flow state, therefore, work ceases to be work. Again, um, nothing creates bonds uh, between group members like uh, a common enemy. COVID is a common enemy today, and we are seeing this, uh, this, in this fight with the virus, relationships are strengthening and bringing out very good things in people that we didn't see before. So this is a good time, for example, for organizations to get their groups more united. In organizations, it's a good time to uh, strengthen community, to build long lasting ties and so forth. Again, research also suggests that uh, positive moods facilitate uh, creative idea generation and negative moods uh, uh, focus attention and facilitate analytic uh, processing. These kinds of information organizations can put to good use. But all these, and all these things have positive implications uh, for uh, performance management, if you align them with what Henry has, uh, has just discussed. But of course, all these benefits will require the generation and distribution of the right kinds of emotions in the right mix and in the right intensities, and of course, at the right time. Thank you. I hope I've answered your question, Eugene. Thank you, Chora. More than, more than, I particularly like your optimism. Right? I particularly like your optimism. Not just that good things will come, from the COVID-19, even with those practical examples, or that relationships are being strengthened. 
But I'm going to write on the flow state that it described because when Uche Uche out of space is in such a flow state. Uh, so Uche in the flow state, but we need two minutes flow state. <laughs> so, so tell us a bit more about legal obligations, obligations of employers and employees that we should keep in mind. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene. Uh, first and foremost, remote working arrangement is not new. And therefore, over time, it has acquired both friends and enemies. We don't need to worry too much about its friends now. The enemies we know traditionally would be trade unionists, regulators. Trade unionists will oppose it. The reason is that they believe it deinstitutionalizes the workplace. Regulators believe it individuates contracts. And therefore, employers must know that in as much as there are benefits that come from remote working, in any case, it is an inevitability now. But that in order to be able to reap these benefits, we must preempt some of these enemies by putting in place what we call not watertight, airtight policies that will address a number of these, their concerns up front. Um, over time, we have seen from international best practice that these areas are already being addressed. Number one area that normally would constitute a battleground in the remote work is the question of eligibility. Again, this is an area where we need a lot of guidance. How do you determine who will be eligible? Is it a person or a position? All these are matters that policy must settle. Also, the question of availability for the remote work. Um, a number of organizations outside Nigeria, even the UK, they have made legislations that in order to ensure that remote work succeeds, it must be accompanied by flexible working arrangement to accommodate the flexibility involved in that area. But of more importance is this issue of when you now run a workplace where there is dual nature of work, some people work remotely, you must address the issue of uh, discrimination because there must be opportunity for all in that workplace. Otherwise, there will be charges of your discriminating against one group or the other. And therefore, tight policy will be required based on sound international best practice to address all these areas up front so that the enemies of uh, remote work are not able to have an upper hand as we implement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uche. Thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you, everyone. Um, this, this is meant to be a teaser a taste of good things to come. Okay, so there'll be many more of these. But I think it's now time to turn to the participants and then look at the questions. Thank you very much for using the Q&A box. Um, at this point, we're going to launch a poll which will be going on while the, we take the questions. And we're going to be taking, I'm going to be taking the questions based on the upvotes. Okay, so I have the first question here, which has been voted by, upvoted by many people. Uh, it looks like this question is for you, Ucheato. It says, what legal rights do employees... Now, what's this? Okay, what legal rights do employees have to reject a directive from company management to resume work? Because they don't feel safe coming to work and there is no provision for remote work from home by the company. I'll take the question again. What re legal rights do employees have to reject a directive from company management to resume work because they don't feel safe coming to work and there is no provision for remote work from home by the company? Um, so you want to take that quickly? All right, yes. Thank you very much. Um, to start with, under the law, every employee owes a duty of obedience. That is fundamental because as Justice Ibazu said in the case of ECN and Nico, any act of disobedience goes to the contract. However, there is a proviso and the proviso is to the fact that in the issue of obedience, it must be again within the context of what is reasonable and then what is lawful so that Disobedience can only be justified where such an act is so manifestly unlawful, manifestly unlawful, 
and also manifestly unreasonable that in the eyes of the ordinary person, everybody will say, no, that shouldn't have been. In this type of situation, if no provision had been made whatsoever, and if for any reason on the part of the employee, he could not have taken some steps, especially like in the area of providing small masks and so on, then disobedience will be, but otherwise, it is very unlawful. It amounts to insubordination, except when those provisos are there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Uche. Now, there's a, this other sort of question that says, uh, I've voted again by many people. I'll just ask a question and then we'll see who takes it. What are the implications of asking staff who have deemed who have been deemed not to be working during this lockdown to proceed on annual leave. What are the implications of asking staff who have been deemed not to be working during this lockdown to proceed on annual leave? Uchara is shaking her head. You want to take a shot? <laughs> uh, Any of you? Can I, can I answer to the question? Yes, okay, Henry. So, so. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. Henry, I beg your pardon. Ladies first. Uchara, please. Okay, so um, I think that when I'm done speaking, perhaps Uche can give us the legal implications because here's the deal. Um, somebody called me uh, about two weeks ago and told me that the organization did something like this. And my response to that person is, what are the conditions that your, organizations, as your organization is supposed to meet before you proceed on annual leave? So she says to me, uh, first of all, we're supposed to receive a leave allowance uh, and, and so on. So I said, did the organization um, provide you a leave allowance? And she said, no. And I'm like, excuse me, um, Uche at all might be able to tell us uh, the implication of asking somebody to proceed on leave without a leave allowance. Um, again, um, you know, I think that, let me go back to emotional intelligence again. You know, organized people are, are really reasonable. People are reasonable. If you, if you start by calling them, first of all, to ask them, how are you doing? How are you doing? How's your family? Um, are you able to find food to eat? Is there somewhere, somewhere in which the organization can assist you or can help? And so on and so forth. You know, and, and I do think that, you know, uh, there are certain things that are better left for, for later. So for example, uh, was it really necessary to start talking about leave now? I mean, when everybody is back from this, while everybody is so happy to survive the COVID, if you say to people, you know what, we have been at home for a long time, the organization needs to be given, given some consideration and so on and so forth. I think that human beings are reasonable. They will cooperate. So it, it kind of sounds a, a little callous when organizations do things like that, however, I will also be the, the first person to say this to you, that you may not know the reason why um, management has sent out that kind of mail. Perhaps they know their people better than uh, other people do. Uh, uh, this would be my, my take on this for now. Thank you. Thank you, Uchora. Henry, uh, you're going to add Well, something? I think uh, Uchora has said what I wanted to say, but um, I think also the employer reserves a right to decide when the employees can go and leave, depending on the, the work that is available, you know, the, the volume of work that is available. But what I think it's wrong, and I think it has I've seen it happen. Uh, in fact, one big organization in the country I just sent a mail uh, to its, its uh, uh, employees, telling them that they have been on leave for the past one month. So updating the leave. So that I think is wrong. But if it is informing them that based on the situation, they are going to uh, embark on an annual leave going forward, and it is communicated in a nice manner, I think that would be okay. But again, I must also bring in the issue of trust. If, are, if the employees trust the organization, they trust that whatever they are doing is in their best interest. But if the trust never existed before, then whatever uh, policy or decision you take now will be taken with a very big pinch of salt. Uh, before I, I leave, I I'd like to comment uh, on the last uh, point um, that the question you asked, Richard, to. 
about employees being uh, able to refuse to go back to work. You know, in my opening remark, I made a mention of uh, the National Policy on Occupational Safety and Health. Paragraph 5.31 of that policy says, and I will quote, no, ensure that, that no measures prejudice the worker should be taken by reference to the fact that in good faith, he or she complain of what is considered to be a breach of statutory requirements or a serious inadequacy in the measures taken by the employer in respect of occupational safety and health and the working environment, which means it is protecting the employees from punishment for refusing to go back to work, even if you call them back to work, if they think that their life will be at stake, I mean, their, their health and their safety will be prejudiced by going back to work. So in that sense, I think the employer has to think twice before asking the employees to go back to work. You don't want to start work and people are falling ill from coronavirus, or even you have a few deaths in your hands. Thank you. Uh, Eugene, you. can I just do yeah, one thing? Uh, Eugene, um, Eugene. Okay, so, all right. Uh, let um, Uchiato, okay, if you don't mind, perhaps there are legal angles to this that may be of benefit to the business. All right. The issue of annual leave is the statutory right of every employee. But we must state here clearly that leave entitlement is at the convenience of the employer. And therefore, the employer has every right to decide when an employee can proceed on leave. The question of leave allowance can be paid anytime. So it does not mean that it is a precondition, certainly not. In any case, there is no statutory obligation. It is usually contractual. However, usually, most employers and employees will reach an agreement in this area. Now, with regard to what Henry has said, this has always been an issue in terms of whether an employee or an individual cannot see on his own determine a situation of, okay, this matter is such that I should disobey. The truth of the matter is that, yes, when a matter is manifestly unreasonable, unlawful, but when an employee makes that decision and uses that as a basis to disobey, suppose that matter is judged by an impartial third party and it is found that there were some other employees who were able to, within the same circumstance, obey that order. It puts that particular employee in jeopardy. And therefore the standard of proof in this area is not that of the person who disobeyed, but then there will be a third party. So it may be risky to use my own standard to say, well, I have judged it is unreasonable. You we'll have to be careful in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uche. Uh, okay, Chico, 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, I, I want to look at it differently. You see, the, that's what I was talking about, this communication and this engagement that goes into it. Now, if you look at the law of distributive justice, people view injustice in distribution very badly if two things are wrong, the procedural just, there's procedural injustice and there is international injustice. Once people see that the procedure is right, the interaction that went to it is right, even if the thing is not likable to them, they have a way of even excusing it. So I think at this period of time, COVID-19 does not obey law too much. When you begin to deal with your employees legally. There are times when both of you should really sit down and see whether there is something you can do to stay afloat and to prepare your organization. Even if it is my right and I see that, look, I need to give up something, provided the organization is ready to give up something as well. You discover the trust is there, we can do anything. Thank you very much, Okechiko. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to ask two questions, okay? Take two questions from the pack, according to the upvoting. The first one says, how do you drive digital adoption remotely? What is a great COVID back to work change management strategy? I'll take that again. How do you drive 
digital adoption remotely? What is a great COVID back to work change management strategy? That's the first question. Then the second one is asking, how do you structure new staff salary for employees working from home, considering things like transportation costs, cost of data, etc. So two questions. Who wants to have a first go at any of them? Thank you very much, Elisaji. Okay. Can I try the second one? Yes, uh, yes, Sergio. I'm How do you structure salaries? And I'm looking at the second one. Bearing in mind the, I mean, when you draw salary, for instance, now if you want to now recruit, we now have an underlying principle now for those recruited that can you work remotely? That is very, very important now. So when you are now looking at salary, salary should look at the environment. Like I said earlier on, let the employers make sure that the virtual environment, where they all stay, like Okichuku said, or somebody, it's in compliance. Then from there, you should look at the petrol, find a way to calculate the petrol, at least you calculate mileage, one way for some guys, you find a way to bring in the petrol, the data as an allowance, not part of the salary. Then of course, you have the industrial scale, what's actually operates in the, like the oil companies, they have their own pay, but this one that we make the workers or the employees to operate very well remotely should be set aside as allowances apart from the salary. Because bearing in mind that there'll be less traffic now, I mean physical traffic, but there'll be more traffic on the data, especially now that everybody is now logging in. And I think after this, there will be a need to also rearrange that some tax should be done at home rather than coming to the office. This also reduces all the traffic on the road, though bringing the traffic back on the data. That's my submission on the second question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sajid. Uh, can I speak uh, on the second question? Uh, just a second. Let, let's, let's give a moment to Kichiko Ama if okay. he was going to add something. OK. Uh, I'm not, the uh, Sajid has a, uh, discuss the second one, okay. but let me okay. just add something on the first. You see, the, when we started working remotely, technology became an issue. And there are two problems from technology. One is the ease of use, which means that some of us will have to do a lot of learning. The second is the quality of those technologies. For example, internet, if you have it, you have to spend a lot of money, and power, you have to spend a lot of money. Now, let me take the one of learning. There are two things that employ employees can do. At this time in time, there is, is not it's going to be very difficult to wait on the employer to lead you in this self-training. You have to look online, look for ways of learning the very tech tool that they have given, the productivity tools, the soft and hardware that you've been given. One is look online, you will see it. The second I would advise organizations is to do a mini what Google Assistant is for. You can develop what I call learning assistant that is unique for your organization. What it does is that experts post in issues relating to the technology you are using, to the productivity software. I can go there, just type what I need, and it will come up. If what I need is not there, I can ask the question, 
and you discover that experts within the organization, in minutes, they will reply and I would be able to have it. The second one of internet and power, there is a, a problem in Nigeria we all know, but people are spending money and we must recognize that people are spending money. Now, organization is passing through its own hardship, which employers, employees must recognize that occasionally organizations may not have that money to add to it. So it now becomes a question of this engagement. How do we strike a balance? Know whether organization can provide and when they can't provide and there is a way I can provide it, provided our common goal is for this organization to survive this time and to be able to operate in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any points we are missing? Anybody like to add something? Okay. Um, yeah, yes, I like to take one minute. minute. Yeah. Okay. Do I have please the right. floor? Thanks. Yes, please. Okay. Chat. Now, this question of remuneration or salary had always come up in terms of how do you treat remote workers vis-a-vis -vis those who work from a particular location? The first issue to resolve is that if you look at the salary structures, things are put under transport allowance, some are put under all kinds of allowances. We must first realize that when we have those headings, they probably may not relate to, for instance, transport, but they are just tax efficient methods of paying compensation. In which case, if we now begin to use that as a basis to treat remote worker differently, that will amount to discrimination. And this had always been a point of problem, especially in other countries, where remote workers will complain that they are being treated differently and that they're a bit inferior. And it's a very big source of demotivation for people who work from remote location. And therefore, my advice at this time is that we must be guided by international best practice, that we must avoid any acts that will tend to put any particular group, more so where those two groups will be working in the same organization. Otherwise, we're creating an unnecessary dichotomy that will be exploited, again, by the traditional enemies of remote work in order to create more difficulties in the system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uche. Um, with, with that comment, I wonder if you are unconsciously responding to my next question, which I have not asked. But let me ask it. If it, if it was already covered, tell me. Otherwise, please take it. It says, if work from home has come to stay, how do you remunerate people in the same group with one working from home and the other working from the office? Should we pay those who work in the office higher? Okay. Yes, Uchiato, was this? All right. Uh, no, it's not covered. We can okay. deal with it. Yes. Okay. Now, the question of potential points in the area of discrimination will always accompany remote work. And therefore, we will have this issue anytime that we begin to transit into a remote working arrangement. And this is a matter that policy must resolve. First and foremost, eligibility. How do we determine who will work from a remote location? And therefore, having made that determination, we must be very careful in the area of especially compensation so that we don't run into the problem of creating an inferior class. And the way you do this clearly is to look at the compensation structure to be sure that the elements there are actually addressing particular issues. I know as a matter of fact, there are many organizations in the private sector, when you find a number of headings in their compensation structure, it is not because they want to use those things for transport. They want to use it for clothing. But they are just putting compensation under those items to be tax efficient. If that is the situation, then there is no way you can deny a man who works from home those opportunities just because he works from home. The reason is that he is doing the same kind of work, delivering on the same basis, so that it cannot be, since in any case, you just structured 
your compensation for purposes of tax efficiency. So you can't discriminate against the remote worker based on that. That would be my thank, answer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Uche. Uh, again, Uche Ato, sorry, uh, you, are the, you are the man on the spot now. I have a very difficult question for you. Difficult because it requires just a yes or no answer. Sorry, it didn't yes. come from me. It came from the audience. Yes. Mr. Atos spoke about contracts. Is he saying there must be a new contract executed from working from home? Because we don't have time, please make that just a yes or no. Um, we all avoid yes and no answer. <laughs> but the head of the department, I don't have too much of a choice. <laughs> That would be that, yes, we need a new contract. But I would Thank like to you. say proviso. But uh, as head of the department, I can You see these lawyers like provisos. Well, I think we have run out of time. Uh, it's been a very interesting conversation, at least for me, hopefully for you as well, that the, the workplace has changed. The worker has not changed, except that the worker is dealing with more things now. And in many cases, the work has not changed. We're trying to adapt that work to a remote condition. So we've considered teams, emotional intelligence, the importance of communication. Thank you very much, Henry, for sharing this simple model. I hope people get to see it again. Like I said earlier, this is just to give you a taste. Visit the website of the Lagos Business School, lbs.edu.ng. There will be many more plans. We don't hope that the lockdown continues. So long, as, eh? so long as we are safe. If we are safe and the lockdown is lifted, fine. If we are not safe and it continues, fine. Whatever the case, please, how do I say, keep in touch with us and then we'll let you know about the other programs. The questions we're not able to answer because of limited time, we'll find a way to get it across to you. Thank you very much, Okechuku okay, Ama. Thank you, Henry Onukuba. Thank you, Lusaji George. Thank you, Choro Doji. Thank you, Uche Ato. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, participants. You're Thank welcome. You. And stay safe, right? Oh, okay. Welcome. Okay. Fantastic. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye.